Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. Uh, my name is John Braden. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And we are so excited to be broadcasting in the home of Simon Critchley, one of the world's leading philosophers, uh, in his Cobble Hill uh, townhouse here. It's just such a lovely neighborhood. And uh, uh, Simon is teaching at the New School. He's teaching uh, a course in Heidegger this semester. And um, it's great that you ha we have you on the show because we are trying to educate our public about cultural things, about philosophical things. and. One of the things, uh, my background is education. I have a strong interest in uh, certain kinds of philosophy that I see that you're into as well. So I got all excited when I read your biography. And I'm very into Martin Buber, you know, because I'm an English professor and I try to create dialogic spaces in my classrooms. And just through researching you, I'm discovering this philosopher named Emmanuel Levinas. Do I say? Levinas. Levinas, who was who is a wonderful philosopher who talks about the other and the face of the other and it's just such beautiful beautiful humanizing ideas and I find it very very transformative so it's just I'm like a kid in a candy store to get you on the show here Simon and we want to uh, you know educate I'm, I want to learn from you from being in this dialogue and then see how we can educate our public about philosophy in a way that's you know that's not so filled with jargon because a lot of philosophers talk in ways over people's heads I'll never forget I was taking a course in philosophy at Fordham when I was an English major and there was one guy who always talked and I could never understand what he was saying and it used to be so annoying I was like well you speak English you know but we realized that you have to have certain terminology and that's important but uh, let's begin with the state of philosophy in America today in particular on the media because we are a television show and I notice that when I watch television at night and I watch the network shows and I watch MSNBC and Fox and try to get a sense of what's going on in our country in the world this day the Pope is in town today in New York. We got we got Bernie Sanders running for president. He's you know leading Hillary Clinton in 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 in, uh, in the polls in Iowa and New Hampshire. We got Donald Trump, the summer of Trump. You know, so we could sort of get a philosophical take on all these things. When 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 I go back and forth between Fox and MSNBC, I notice you very rarely, if ever, see a philosopher making sense of what's happening in the world. So why don't we start with that and talk about why? Why don't you? To see more philosophers out there in media, okay? And then what would your philosophical take be on, 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 the, on the country and the state of political affairs in, in 2015? So, well, yeah, um, so philosophy is, um, you don't get philosophers very often on TV, that's for sure. Um, I mean, one thing that I've been doing for uh, five years now <clears throat> is running a, a column with the New York Times called The Stone, which is a philosophy column, uh, which has a significant readership. We publish things every week, sometimes twice a week, and, you know, we have um, millions of readers. And so, um, in the press, to some extent, Places like the Times. Uh, there's um, if you if you do philosophy in a way that's accessible to a uh, a larger population in a way that's clear and free of jargon, uh, you can reach a large audience. Well, on television, it doesn't. There's no question it doesn't work as well. I mean, it's it's more television works. So so philosophy works well on the radio. Uh, so where I'm from, uh, there's a tradition of intellectuals, philosophers, all sorts of people uh, speaking on on radio shows, and at quite a high level. That's in England now. In England, in England. Where so, the, in England? well, I'm from in Liverpool, but I grew up just north of London, oh. and the uh, 
so it works on the radio. Does it work on TV? Will it not as well as it might do? We'll see if we can refute that. So, but there is, I'm convinced that there is, um, not convinced, I mean, it, 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 is, it is the case that there is a large audience for philosophy in the United States. And with the, the work with the New York Times, we've, we've proven that. And it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's an audience which is, um, which is very articulate, uh, which we know through comments and through bumping into readers here, here and there. And um, they don't want to be patronized. They don't want a kind of dumbed down version of philosophy or a kind of soundbite version of philosophy, which is what you get <clears throat> if you have philosophers on, you know, talk shows, all the news. They want the real thing, um, but they want it in a way that's accessible to a large audience, so, so no jargon. So I'm quite um, optimistic about the state of philosophy in the United States. Because the usual view is that, you know, the United States is an anti-intellectual country, and there are, uh, you know, and there are other countries particularly say Western European countries which uh, where philosophy is much more of a public role, yeah. particularly say France or Germany. Yeah. And here people are, you know, just aren't really interested. That's not true. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a huge uh, college educated and non-college educated audience out there and they want something uh, that doesn't patronize them, doesn't speak down to them and is about issues which they care about or issues which they can discover something about. So I, I don't think it's uh, so bad. And but the state of the world. What was the other question? What would the? Yeah. Well, if you were, if, if you know, let's say you were on one of these big shows, and and uh, well, our show maybe could be a big show one day, and, and you know, maybe maybe with your appearance on our show, it will become a big show. But like, if, if, if let's say, meet the press, meet the press. You know, I mean, you see, meet the press, and they have like the sort of talking head format, which is very fast paced, back and forth, but it doesn't slow down and get reflective. If you were on a meet the press or a face the nation, and you had to give your your sort of elevator speech on what the state of politics in America and the education and culture at this moment in time in uh, the fall of 2015, again, coming out of the summer of Trump, with democracy being threatened by big money and all those issues that are going on, uh, what, would give, what would your analysis be from a philosophical point of view? Um, well, uh, I was away in the summer. Um, I was away for two months, which was which saved me from a lot of the Trump stuff. So that I, you know, okay. I just missed it. So I, I came back at the end of August and into this kind of alternate reality of Trump world. Um, it's you know I'm not probably the right person to ask about the state of politics in the United States. I think it's you know there's there's all sorts of really obvious things which. Um, should have been done, that could be done, that aren't, and there's no prospect of them happening. Mm. Um, like, you know, socialized medicine, mm. uh, free education. Mm. We could continue the list. Yeah. Uh, gun control, <clears throat> things like that, which is just kind of, you know, they're too obvious to even have to mm. argue for planned parenthood, all these things. So there's a kind of um, a bizarre quality to, um, much American political discourse that bewilders me at the national level, and um, I mean, I've, you know, I'm a, <coughs> a spectator on it. I'm I'm curious about it, but uh, skeptical at the same time, and um, and I don't expect any you know huge transformations anytime soon. So, and the other obvious thing which other people talk about which could be done would be to remove money from politics. You would have some kind of uh, taxation or just you could you could fund candidates, uh, candidates for different kinds of office would receive a certain amount of funding for their campaigns and that's all they'd be allowed to use and that would solve at a stroke any number of problems. So, so these are kind of just obvious things and the um, so I think at the the national level, it's a kind of 
bizarre spectacle that doesn't really I mean I, I'm aware of it going on but it doesn't really engage me and then at the the local level it's a, a different picture there's tons of stuff happening and there's people with all sorts of views which aren't represented nationally and there's um there are interesting things going on and, and battles to be fought so one characteristic of the <clears throat> the US for me has always been its scale that this is a big country geographically and um, at the national level the federal level you have these institutions which were developed at a certain point end of the 18th century which have a certain shape and there's a kind of almost theological attachment that people have to some of them and we could but I wouldn't confuse that with real politics which is local and variegated and complex and which that interests me a lot more what's going on around here or what's going on you know in this this city or if I live somewhere else what what people in that location are concerned with and uh, are struggling about so and for me there's always been some um, you know there's a powerful um, if you like localism in, in in American life because people live somewhere in this huge country mm. and um, that's where the interesting stuff happens it seems to me well, I've always been a big fan of Socrates and this whole idea of philosophical discourse and in the public space when you engage the stranger. Um, I was teaching uh, English at Bariqua College earlier this year, which is on 155th Street and Broadway. And that area there uh, is like this cluster of classical buildings that were built around 1900. And you have, it was the original uh, American Numismatic Society that was there, the Hispanic Society of America, all this, it's called Audubon Terrace. And uh, the building that Bariqua College was in was, uh, was the original American Geographical Society. So it's like this outpost of classical buildings mm -hmm. around a terrace. And it, they said it was originally designed to be the American Acropolis. And when I when I read that, I, I got so excited, you know, because that has something that o has always inspired me. I, I've been teaching now for 20 years, teaching English as an English educator, and um, I discovered philosophy around the time when I got into education, and especially Martin Buber has always been very important to me, you know, this idea of the I and thou, the sacredness of human dialogue, and also Carl Rogers in psychology, the, 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 the Rogerian idea that you help people grow, and, and I think you have an interest in psychoanalysis as well, I noticed in your work. Um, how can we improve the quality of human conversation? We're trying to do that on our show. We're creating salons, and we're getting people together. How, what would be your analysis on the take of human conversation in our society in America today. You walk into cafes sometimes, everyone's on their laptops, and it, it, d does one need a humanistic education to have better conversations, let's say? Or could, could, could philosophy help? Um, you don't need a humanistic education to have decent conversations, that's for sure, uh, uh, although it, it might help. I mean, the state of conversation in the US, or indeed in the world, as I, as I experience it, is kind of terrible people have got to switch off their phones I mean it's it's the you know things are people live in live in a kind of their own narcissistic or well, their own private Idaho their own kind of narcissistic bubble which just reflects back to them what they what they already know um, and it's 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 hideous so the first so I think I notice when I'm uh, in workspaces not you know not where I would not the university I work at but in if I go to say publishers offices or something like that is how quiet they are because yes. people are sitting there with headphones on mm. um, everyone's in their, their bubble so conversation is um, is uh, you know is, is kind of under threat I think yeah. so so dialogue I mean I mean Buber is a uh, I mean I and they I mean I read that when I was um, in my first year at uh, college. I went to college late when I was 22, so I had a very a misspent youth. But the um, yeah, I did. But the but the um, but I now made a huge impression on me. But Socrates. I mean, the, the figure of Socrates and the it's, it's interesting to think about that because um, 
you know, it's um, I mean, there's there's a there's a, a nice way of thinking about Socrates. He was this um, older figure that you know wandered around the the public space, the agora, asking questions and um, raising difficult issues, and that's a nice thing to do. But he was um, he was he was tried and executed by the city of Athens, which was a city that um, you know was had nominally been, nominally been a democracy for the previous century, although in the Athenian way, so there was no franchise for, for women and slaves. So, but the the city killed Socrates. So, if Socrates was the first philosopher, there are different ways of arguing that. You can say, well, there were people concerned with the understanding of nature before Socrates, and they're philosophers too. But if we say the philosophy as a public activity of dialogue begins with uh, Socrates, then Socrates is is killed by the city. Mm. And he's killed by the city on the charges of um, impiety towards the gods, impiety towards the gods of the city, and corruption of the youth. And um, and those are two interesting charges. And I, I mean, I, I take them seriously that what we're doing um, in philosophy is a kind of impiety. Uh, impiety towards whatever the gods of the city are or the gods of the state are uh, and secondly we should be corrupting the youth we should be you know we should be causing trouble we should be shaking things up Socrates compared himself to a a gadfly or a cow fly that was kind of flying around the great ass of the state and causing all sorts of trouble but we have to f remember that um, speaking freely about masses of fundamental human concern can cost you your life, and in many parts of the world that's still the case. Right? And um, I mean, democracy is, um, the relationship between philosophy and democracy is also a, it's a delicate topic. I mean, in the sense in which you could say, yeah, philosophy is about freedom of speech it's about um it, you know it's about this dialogue where people are equal and uh, this is consistent with a democratic view of things mm. that's um but philosophy has got a very bad track record when it comes to democracy i mean the first philosopher that was really in favor of democracy was probably john dewey an american you know, relatively recent uh, but you know if you look at characters like Nietzsche, all the way back to Plato, um, there's a consensus that democracy, which is understood as rule by the majority, is a bad thing. And uh, it's going to lead to stupidity, it's going to lead to bad political decisions, it's probably going to lead to war and bloodshed. So, um, so, the, so <coughs> Socrates um, had a uh, there's a number of occasions when he talks about the um, the nature of the philosopher and um, the the location of the philosopher, and it's clear that the and he tells a story which is a story of um, the first natural philosopher Thales, who was uh, pondering the heavens so intently that he fell into a ditch, right? and there was a, a serving girl, a Thracian serving girl, who laughed at him. So philosophy begins with somebody falling into a ditch and somebody laughing at them. And, and what, that, what that indicates for Socrates is that the place of the philosopher is not really in the city. The philosopher is always going to be someone um, at odds with the city who's going to look like a fool or a madman when, or a mad woman when they enter the city. And so, um, so ph the, the philosopher is this, this, this creature who is um, kind of at odds with the place in which they inhabit, the city they inhabit, mm -hmm. and which indeed is, and who indeed is you know, also at threat from that place. So, and there's a long history of imprisoned philosophers, you know, from Socrates through to people like Gramsci. 
and uh, and more recent examples. So, um, you know, it's so if, is philosophy a good thing? Yes. Is it consistent with democratic life? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, it's it's wonderful. I mean, just that one of the things I notice about you, Simon, and I've no, I've, I've looked at some of the past YouTubes that are online, in particular the one where you have a wonderful dialogue at the Brooklyn Museum with a conceptual artist. Uh, I forget his name, Liam. Liam Gillick, yeah. Yeah, your friend, a wonderful dialogue. And what I loved about that dialogue was you could see the outside through the glass, and you could see like the street kids were out there on their skateboards and stuff. It was wonderful. And as it got dark, yeah, well, no, I thought it was, I was watching what happened inside as well, and one thing I notice about you is that you enjoy this process of dialogue and you kind of think out loud, mm -hmm. and that's something that we're trying to promote, that's something that's been important in my pedagogy, is, is, is in terms of how language is a tool and conversation is a tool, and that we could discover something in the process of talking, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, Bakhtin is somebody who's very important to my philosophy, Mikhail Bakhtin, who did a lot of work on Dostoevsky, <clears throat> and, and in Dostoevsky there's a lot of dialogue going on. People are encountering each other on the streets and in doorways and things like that. I have a strong recollection of the first time I read Dostoevsky, I was in my 20s, and I was reading Crime and Punishment, and at the time I had just moved to Hoboken, which is a small city, and they have a main street, which is Washington Street, which is where all the crowds of people are. And I had, you know, my, my, my previous experience was one of alienation in the crowd, and something about Dostoevsky that created a space of some kind of magic almost, that one day I was on the avenue and I looked around and I felt a glowing, like I could see almost the, in, the souls of the people were coming alive, and I, I had a feeling of a community, that the, this could actually be a community. And, I, and, I, and I'm sure this had to be because I was reading Dostoevsky at the time. So my question to you, and I know you have an interest in literature, and theater, what particular works of literature and theater have impacted you? Um, another confession here is that my grandmother was brought to America by a famous actress in 1909. She was born in London and she was an orphan in an orphanage and she was rescued by Blanche Walsh, who was one of the top stars of the Belle Epoque period, known for serious drama. And she was most known for her work as Maslova in Tolstoy's Resurrection, which was his most political and provocative book, and a book that was also filled with love and the redeeming qualities of love. So I know I'm asking a lot, and because it's like so exciting to talk to a real philosopher, so thinking about the works of literature and the works of cinema, what particular works have brought as Virginia Woolf says, she says that a, a work of art can give you a moment of being. I love that phrase, a moment of being, you know, that sort of penetrates the fog of the, of the submergence and the ordinary, the banal, the routine. Mm -hmm. Just give a list of some of the top, if you could think of any off the top, I mean, yeah. All right, well, I, that's, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, art, um, you know, very generally, literature very generally is, a, is for me, it's about, it, it, it's a kind of quickening of life. It's a kind of there is a kind of an aliveness that you find in in, in these these works, which uh, which I mean I began um, when I eventually went to college and I was twenty two um, as a student of literature. So I began yeah, and it was but I wasn't terribly impressed by the teachers. I thought I could. See through them, or I thought, uh, I th you know, you know I, I could, I could have imagined doing some of what they were doing, yeah. and there were these other creatures who were from the philosophy department, and I had no idea how they did what they, how they did what they did, and that intrigued me. So I switched to philosophy at the end of the first, my first year. But I had a, I've always had a, you know, a, a, an abiding interest in literature, and um, so what would I pick? Um, well, I was, you know, one of these people that was um, a kind of uh, invention of the um, 
of Penguin, Penguin, this publisher in the, the UK that published series called Penguin Classics and Penguin Modern Classics. And the Penguin Classics books were paperbacks, very cheap, black, and the modern classics were a kind of pale green. And um, you could basically get an education from what they, they published. And so I read Penguin Modern Classics. I read uh, Camus' Myth of Sisyphus. I read uh, Sartre's Nausea. I read Sartre's Roads to Freedom. Um, I was a kind of existentialist at the beginning. In many ways, I still am. And then, you know, there were the black books. You know, I read Flaubert. I read Nietzsche. I am. Um, and then I, you know, and so it was a question of just um, those were the books that kind of got my juices flowing. You thought there is a kind of a, there's something going on here that I want to, I want more of. And that sent me back and forward. And uh, But for me, the book, if there was a book that I was going to, there's a number, it's an impossible question, but I mean, one book which I, it's behind us somewhere uh, is Joyce's Ulysses because Joyce's Ulysses is um, for me it's something about the <clears throat> you're talking about your experience in, in Hoboken and, and imagining a kind of seeing a kind of community I mean what uh, what Joyce does with his you know, novel of that one day in 1904 in um, in Dublin is to open up this entire world through these characters, Stephen Dedalus, Leopold Bloom, the sublime Molly Bloom. And, um, and with that, you see this whole world come to life. And it's a, it's a world that is real. Joyce did, was writing fiction, but it was true in the sense in which he was obsessive about uh, description and making sure that everything he said was accurate. And yet, every and, and and also Joyce's Ulysses is a kind of um, inhabitation of every literary genre, every literary form, and all the great previous writers. Joyce kind of um, inhabits them, picks up what they're doing, mocks them, moves on. So it's a kind of summation of everything that literature is about. It's an epic tale, but it's about a day in a city with people talking, right? And that's really what it's about. So that, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think I'd take, I mean, Joyce's Ulysses would be at the top of the pile. And then, you know, for me, it's been, um, I mean, the Greeks have been hugely important, um, particularly ancient Greek theatre, um, the plays of Sophocles and Euripides in particular, and Aeschylus too, but the, and there's only 31 of them. <clears throat> so you can read them in a, you can read all the Greek tragedies in about, I don't know, five, six weeks, at, at a reasonably leisure, leisurely, play, leisure, leisurely pace, and you can, yeah, think, so that, that, that's, that's good. And then, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I there's a, I mean, I think that, um, I think that, I don't think that, literature and art heal things. I don't think it's a kind of neosporin. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a balm. I don't necessarily think that literature is like Guinness. It's good for you. I don't think it's, that's, that's not the case. It's, it, it, but it gives you a kind of, um, in a way that I think is finally superior to philosophy, literature, theatre, give you a view of human complexity and ambiguity that um, at the most at the most intense and critical phases of of, of an existence that's, been, that's playing out in front of you and um, often what philosophy does is it tries to um, sort those things out to clarify them free them of ambiguity and um, to that extent you know I'm uh, a, a large part of me is is anti-philosophical. I mean, I want mm. I want to um, I want us to be able to to be with uncertainty and ambiguity and human complexity um, and and to and to be with that 
for a, for a long, long time and to watch it and watch the way it moves and twists and turns. And, um, and we, uh, we're intent usually on looking the other way. We want easy answers and fast solutions. Yeah. And um, there's a lot more I could say about that. Well, that's kind of like how our media is set up also for the easy answer and, and all that and the lack of complexity. Um, I made the decision to become an English major uh, in, in psychoanalysis when I had dropped out of college and I was in my early 20s and I was in a depression in the year 1985. I was deep in a depression. I was questioning who I was and my identity and ne neither my mom or dad had gone to college so I was like you know the first one in my nuclear family to go. I had an uncle who was a dentist but uh, in terms of what I was going to study and what do you want to do for the rest of your life and I was really wrestling with that. I wound up as an accountant clerk. It was one of the most boringest jobs I had in my life and it was really feeling this existential despair and then I got myself into, psych into psychotherapy and it was through that process that I began to think of if I could have a humanistic education I would be able to then think better, have things to say, be able to look at the world differently and it was through the dialogues with my psychoanalyst that I was able to shepherd that forward and then get myself into Fordham University for a, uh, a bachelor program in, in uh, English education uh, in, in edu I'm sorry, in literature mm -hmm. then I went on to NYU for a master's degree in English education one of the people we learned about in that program was the, one of the founders of that program her name was Louise Rosenblatt who, uh, she wrote a book in 1938 called Literature as Exploration, where she got away from that rigid model of, you know, the new criticism and how boring it can be. Certain English teachers, they take the fun out of it and they don't let you have an opinion. So I learned this very student-centered method that was grounded in this Rosenblattian, I will say, because she was one of the great seminal figures. She lived to be a hundred years old. Uh, she was a roommate of Margaret Mead also when she was at Barnard. So she's a seminal figure and she was able to connect literature with democracy and that the way literature is taught can either facilitate democratic life or, or, or the opposite, you know. So teaching, so for me, education is very democratic and the two of those processes go together. Let's talk about your classes and how they're run in terms of when you teach. Is it, are they run in a way, do you, do you get energy from your students? Do you get ideas? I know you're teaching at the new school. This is one of the top universities and I'm sure the students are very bright. And how, how do those interactions work when you're in class? How do, your, how do the conversations go? Um, well, the classes are usually big, yes. um, the graduate classes. And so I tend to talk more than they do. Yes. Um, and so the style is probably more autocratic than democratic. I mean, I wish that wasn't the case, but that's the... So often what I'm doing in lecture classes is um, is, is something very, very old-fashioned. Um, there's no, no technology. I have a book, usually a big book. I'm trying to explain bit by bit, and we read, uh, we read 20 pages, 30 pages very closely. And I lay it out, and then there are questions and thoughts and whatever. But it's just um, me, the book, and a blackboard or a whiteboard, where I can write words down. So it's a very, very old-fashioned, deliberately kind of low-tech approach. Another approach to teaching which <clears throat> um, I've adopted in the last few years, um, which is, uh, you know, again, it's it's very old-fashioned but for me it's become important uh, for example in the spring I did a seminar on Hamlet on Shakespeare's Hamlet oh. and um, and the the seminar all it was was uh, for 14 weeks we read every word of the play out loud oh. and uh, students took roles either they were they volunteered or I pressed them into taking roles so everybody spoke and so every word of the text was sounded in the room scene by scene and 
that's basically all we did. There was there, there was a, there was a ton of um, um, there's a ton of interpretations of Hamlet for sure. Yeah. Choices Ulysses being one of them, yeah. and um, and you know psychoanalytic interpretations and many many other things. But but for me, uh, what I've noticed with students is um, the is they're getting worse at the most um, most important thing, which is close and slow reading. Right. So what what I see as my you know pedagogical um, task is trying to get students to slow down, to ruminate, to focus on these these words and for example in in the case of um, Hamlet not to read through those words for some meaning or for some view that can then be interpreted and one way or another but to look at the the line and to look at what Shakespeare is doing with language this is poetry after all and um, and to pay attention to rhythm and meter and rhyme and punctuation and vocabulary and just to and so with Shakespeare um, maybe even more so in the US than in than in Britain um, there's a Shakespeare industry and um, we we all think that we understand what the plays are about uh, and we don't we don't know what the language is doing it's it's really really hard so getting people to slow down to, to ruminate on these words and then in the class to kind of let to let the students themselves be as it were ventriloquized by Shakespeare's words and then to find other words to elaborate that uh, whether that's um, democratic or not I don't know I think it's it's um, it can be fantastically um, empowering and emboldening. I mean, what I want is for students to feel that this is, they're in, they're in possession of these things, right? These things are in possession of them, right? Firstly, that they are, they're haunted, firstly, at the level of language. If you speak the English language in the United States in 2015, well, there are two fundamental books. There's the King James Bible and the Shakespeare, and we're spoken by those things rather than speaking uh, we're spoken through so it's, there's an act of ventriloquism at the, yeah. on, the, on the first level and then to and then to and then to give students a kind of deliberateness and confidence with language and um, I mean you know it, it always pleases me when when students you know acquire a kind of eloquence and a, a capacity for thought in a class that they didn't have before and that's that's what I see myself as trying to do. And if they can, if they can write like that as well, then um, then so much the better. Wow. <laughs> wow. You um, wrote the Oxford introduction book to continental philosophy, and this has been one of my obsessions: continental philosophy, figuring out what it is, uh, being attracted to it. Um, one of our guests on our show, one of our former guests, was Edith Kurzweil, who was an editor at Partisan Review. She was the last editor of Partisan Review, uh, which was the major intellectual magazine in America, one of the major magazines in the 20th century. And her husband, William Phillips, used to pick up John Paul Sartre at the airport when he would visit uh, New York back in the 40s and the first place he would stop would be William Phillips who was Edith's husband <laughs> uh, at their apartment you know so this idea of continental philosophy John Paul Sartre existentialism uh, a person who had a big impact on my life her name was Maxine Green she was a philosopher of education at Columbia. She died last year, she was 96 years old, and the New York Times obituary called her the philosopher queen of Teachers College. And she said that Sartre was her doppelganger. 
She was, you know, and she would have these salons at her apartment, which I used to go to, and she was very concerned about people, about community, and through reading her books and her essays, and I got very into this idea, especially with John Dewey, because they say that Maxine Green was like the successor to Dewey, many people felt, and she was very into putting art as central in the classroom, you know, uh, works of literature and, and cinema and reflecting on that. So how could you give our audience and myself a basic idea of what is continental philosophy and how does it mm. differ from analytic Anglo philosophy and in a nutshell, and do you think that a greater knowledge of continental philosophy, what would that do for our country and for people today? Mm. Um. So, um, how would I begin to answer that? I mean, it's it's the. I mean, the term continental philosophy uh, is an, a term that it goes back a couple of hundred years. It's not it's not recent. There's a, there's a it's it's something which has been in the air for at least since the early late 18th century, early 19th century. And the best place to start, I think, is with um, two essays that, um, that John Stuart Mill wrote in 1832 and 1840. The first essay was called Bentham, about Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian philosopher. And the second essay was called Coleridge about the poet Coleridge. So those are both uh, essays occasioned by the deaths of these two figures. And in those um, essays, Mill says, he talks about continental philosophy right, already back then. Uh, he talks about that in relation to Coleridge, because Coleridge was inspired by German philosophy, uh, in particular, uh, the German idealists like Schelling. And in his early days, in his more radical period, he was inspired by revolutionary French politics. So there was a sense in which what was coming out of the continent was um, politically radical and uh, philosophically radical. And um, the um, and Mill says there are um, there are two tendencies or two. He puts it this way, he says, whoever would want to understand what he calls the English philosophical mind, which is a kind of a strange, some people think there isn't such a thing as an English philosophical mind, but there we are. The English philosophical mind should uh, understand that there are these two tendencies, a Benthamite tendency, which is, let's say, broadly empirical, uh, linked to science, and actually interested in, in reform, things like that, and the Coleridgean tendency, which is more speculative, more romantic, closer to the concerns that we would associate with literature and the arts. And those two um, tendencies can be linked to two questions, uh, Mill says. The Benthamite, let's say, uh, analytic, We'll define that in a second. Uh, tendency, ask the question of any doctrine, is it true? Is it true? The Coleridgean tendency, ask the question, what is the meaning of it? So one way of thinking about that distinction between content of philosophy and whatever the other side's going to be called is a distinction between uh, a concern for, for truth and what is, say, empirically verifiable um, scientifically verifiable, logically consistent on the one hand, and then a concern with meaning. Um, what is the meaning of it? How can we understand um, how can we understand a practice or a, or a tradition or a, or a culture? And to, uh, to understand that, we have to read its myths, understand its stories, and so on and so forth. So I think that the um, there are these two tendencies, Benthamite, Coleridgean, continental broadly, humanistic, concerned with literature and interpretation, and this a more scientific tendency, empirical tendency. And <clears throat> those two 
tendencies um, are part of the kind of internal dialogue of, of um, a culture like England and also in, a, in an analogous way, not exactly the same, but in an analogous way, you can find very similar uh, things in, uh, in, in American culture. I mean, that Coleridgean tendency would be what, uh, what occurs um, with figures like Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman and Melville. And in a sense, that Benthamite tendency is what's driving you know, the concern with science, empiricism, uh, technology, and all the rest. And so it's rather than, rather than seeing it as an, um, a straightforward, because you can see the distinction between analytic and cognitive philosophy as a kind of um, professional distinction between um, different kinds of philosophers who attach themselves to different lineages. And, um, you know, and I'm always inclined to think, well, so what? I mean, why is that so important? If you attach it to this broader kind of cultural question of the kind of questions that we ask, the questions we ask each other, is something true? What is the meaning of it? We have something much more interesting. And, and so I think that the part of the internal story, the internal kind of, not even dialogue, the internal kind of argument in a, in, in a culture, say like the United States, is between those two tendencies. And different figures like Sartre, for example, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, will awaken um, those kinds of Coleridgean questions, you know, those deep searching interpretive questions. And we associate that with the continental, with the, you know, with something French or German or whatever. And, but there's a long, this is a, this is a much part of a much longer story about the um, about the way in which uh, a culture like the United States sees itself, and um, I can say more about that. But the the but the way in which um, yeah. I mean philosophy in the United States has a you know a long and interesting history, and there were incredibly important figures like. Peirce and James and Dewey that we think of as pragmatists, but actually they were much more complicated than that. And, uh, and they weren't even in philosophy departments for the most, for the most part. James was in psychology or whatever. And um, that kind of, and there's a kind of breadth and um, generosity. William James says this thing in um, the, the beginning of the varieties of religious experience, which is a uh, is a fascinating book, and this is a, it begins with these words. It says, "It's um, I'm 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 convinced that it's uh, of greater value to um, know a wide range of particulars rather than to cultivate the abstract, to cultivate abstractions, however general those abstract and how however valid those abstractions might be." And I see that as a, as an important tendency that there's a there's a tendency in American culture and more generally to a kind of broad cultivation of particulars in their variety and variegation. And that was something that was, um, you know, uh, if you like, native to American philosophy. Um, what's happened in the last generations, the last, say, really since the, really since the Second World War, is uh, philosophy has become a much narrower, professionalized discipline that takes place in universities um, and it's about publishing it sees itself as a quasi scientific activity and um, it polices itself and it polices other other disciplines and it's of no real general concern to um, the general public most most people in the US don't know the names of any philosophers, or if they, you know, if they know the names of one or two philosophers, then they're probably people that are doing work which isn't really taken seriously in professional philosophy. So um, I think that, so that state of affairs, the way in which philosophy has become this uh, Ivy, I've, um, <laughs> I was going to say Ivy Tower, <laughs> Ivy League, Ivory Tower activity, and it's lost. Uh, it's lost access to these general questions, I think, is a, is, is a cultural 
disaster. So for me, figures like Sartre are hugely important because he's raising, and he raised, all the fundamental philosophical questions, but he did it in a way that spoke to people. Right? And he did it in the form of long philosophical treatises, but also in theatre, in literature, and also through his his public, uh, his Lectures. public, he yeah. Work. Well, he, he, he just, he was out and about a lot, you know. He was yeah. someone, you know, he was writing for the newspapers, he was you know, giving speeches at protests, and he was, you know, he was, you know, an engaged intellectual figure. And, and, um, in May of 68, he was on the barricades? Barricades, yeah, sure. Okay. There you go, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, so, we could do with, um, yeah, so Sartre's a very interesting figure. Wow. Um, Stanley Aronowitz is a person whose ideas are important to me, and he uh, is at the CUNY Grad Center. Claudia and I saw Stanley uh, at the Brooklyn Book Festival on Sunday, and he was giving a wonderful, he was on a panel discussion with Margot Jefferson, who's also a wonderful thinker, And but Stanley just was tremendous and he's great, he's charismatic, he gets his points across and he's, you know, he comes out of a tradition also from the Bronx and from New York and from a working class background and with unions and he communicates to people very well and his student Cornell West has done very well. I want people to know that Stanley, you know, was uh, Cornell West's uh, professor. Uh, Cornell is, you know, made a tremendous impact in terms of uh, on the popular culture, in terms of thinking, you know, and getting it out there and communicating a spiritual discourse, a political, philosophical discourse in a way that speaks to people. Um, you know, he was on uh, the David Letterman show. David Letterman had him on right toward the end of his run and he invited him on. I, I heard that Stephen Colbert, uh, who now is has the new Late Show uh, after Letterman uh, is looking to feature more philosophical and intellectuals. Well, here we got somebody right over here would be a great uh, uh, guest. But uh, yeah, so uh, Stanley Aronowitz has had a big impact on me. I've been actually at his house a few times, and you know, so that's been very helpful in having discussions with him. And he, he has a phrase that he calls a Marxist of the chair. He said, years ago, the socialists, they were all organized. They were in the streets. He said, now you have the Marxists of the chair. But now with Bernie Sanders, that could be different. Now socialism is no longer a dirty word. So I know you're naming the problems, and it's important to name the problems. But we have, Claudia says, we have about six minutes left. Let's try to turn towards hope. And I'm very excited just to be with you here today. I think this is a wonderful dialogue. I hope it's only the beginning. And learning from you and with you. And um, so. Uh, let's uh, think about in terms of what is getting you excited these days in terms of your teaching, your teaching Heidegger, in terms of the philosophical currents. So wh where do you see some hope? Was Heidegger a hopeful guy? I mean, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, um, I'm not. I think that the, there's this great line in Sophocles when, um, uh, from the Antigone where the chorus say, and here comes hope to tickle your feet. And then you realize it's the soles of the feet are on fire. Oh, oh. And that tends to be my view of hope. Yeah. I think that, and I, I, I agree very much with someone. I think Cornell West is um, uh, a unique, sadly unique. I mean, that, that maybe, maybe he'll be joined by other, other African American intellectuals of his kind of quality and, uh, and range and penetration, but a unique figure. And he comes out of this tradition I was talking about, this, this American tradition, which is about, you know, a kind of evasion of philosophy. Cornell's early big book was the American evasion of philosophy, but this linking of, of pragmatism to, um, to progressive politics. But <clears throat> that has to be seen against the background of catastrophe. And it has to be seen um, with no certainty of that things are necessarily going to get better. And I think what, what, what's vindicated Cornell, in my eyes, uh, not in, in, in the public's eyes, um, not in my eyes, in the public's eyes, is the, um, the way in which the question of, of race has re-emerged with this this violent force in the last couple of years. Um, and I think there's, and the, the real story of the United States is obviously the story 
of of race, and um, that is the the scar, the, the the flaw, which at one level everybody knows is there, and for most of the time people don't see or they don't choose to see. So there's something for me, uh, and I, I see this in 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 Cornell's work about recognizing the catastrophe, the disaster from which we come, and not imagining that you know. It was all groovy back in the day, and things things were fine. This was this was um, <clears throat> this is a system based upon a brutal act of expropriation, extermination. That's what uh, that's what made this country. And so, all questions of of of, uh, of hope and change that you know people like Obama were selling as kind of snake oil years ago, to my mind, have to be qualified by this much. More, uh, much more tragic picture. That doesn't mean that um, things ain't going to change, but it means they have to be they have to be seen in a much more realistic light. And what figures like Cornell West are doing, I think, powerfully is 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 shining a light on those issues. Well, you know, the time has gone so quickly. Uh, they say time f flies when you're having fun, and it's really, really true. You got me even more excited about philosophy, uh, Simon. I'm ready to put my toga on and, and, and head out to Smith Street over there, where I'll bet you you are probably recognized. I just finished writing a book on fame, where I think that fame needs to be reimagined and reconceptualized, and we need to hold up different kind of people for fame. I think fame has gotten very degraded, but certainly you are a person who already he is a famous philosopher, but you ought to be more famous, I think, for a better world. And we're going to look for that. And we, this has been a wonderful, you're a humble, sweet man. And you just, for me, this has been such a treat. I'm going to look to read more of your work. And ladies and gentlemen, you know, we're so lucky to have Mr. Simon Critchley on our show, one of the leading philosophers in our world, professor at the New School. Keep on your philosophizing. And, and thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.